Welcome to the second in a series of interviews on disinformation and the threat it poses to democracy in the EU. This series is produced by Europe Direct Blanchardstown Library, part of the Fingal Network of Libraries. In this second interview, I spoke to MEP Maria Walsh about the meaning of democracy in the EU and the threat posed to it by disinformation in the digital age. Maria Walsh, MEP, thank you for speaking to Europe Direct Blanchardstown. Um, we're really delighted that you're joining us to talk about this really important topic. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, great, great to connect um, uh, over Zoom to anybody who has a smiling uh, and shining face like yourself, Barry. <laughs> thank you so much, Maria. And you're in Strasbourg at the moment, am I right? I'm that? currently sitting in Strasbourg looking out onto, onto the Parliament uh, inner circle. Yeah, so uh, we're this is our first session back of, yes. uh, of post-summer. Um, so we're officially out of summer recess and, and into, and, into work and uh, one vote down and another in about an hour's time. So it, it's, it's busy, which is, which is good. It's nice to be back and seeing more and more people again. Absolutely. Look, I know that only too well. We've only started getting back into libraries and it's, it's great to see people and see the public again. And you sound like you've certainly hit the ground running. So listen, with, with that in mind, you, you talked about votes. So um, when we talk about EU democracy, so specifically democracy at an EU level, what exactly do we mean by that? And what does it mean to, to me, for example, the average citizen? Yeah, I mean, a, a great question, because I think if you're at all interested in the way the political landscape is changing, not just in Ireland, locally, regionally or nationally, but across Europe, across the world, it's ever shifting. Um, it's on the, you know, the the, the tidal plates of, of change, um, which is exciting if you're if you're a person like myself who is very new into politics relatively when you compare me to any other of my colleagues. Um you know, I didn't grow up in party politics. I didn't grow up in the political system really at all, other than the fact that I knew my voice and my vote had a, had a, had merit um, and how to exercise that both, um, you know, in, in Ireland where I grew up, but I was born in the States. So I spent a couple of my, a couple of my years in my twenties in there. So voting was really, really uh, echoed. I grew up in a community-based charity led house. So everything from sweeping the community center to um, church kick collections, to serving dinners at senior citizens uh, uh, days out, you name it. And, and, and we are involved in it as a family. Um, but when you talk about EU democracy, you know, there's so many facets to that. So, you know, for me personally, it is what I what I try and do for my constituents in Midlands Northwest. So the 13 counties, Galway, to Donegal, Mayo, across to Louth um, on, a, on a daily basis. But I don't just represent the over a million people in that constituency. I also represent um, people like myself, like yourself, um, um, and Irish people right across the European Union, because everything I put in or add into amendments, legislation, everything I debate or discuss has to also be through the prism uh, of of those living in Germany, France, Hungary, Poland. Uh, in particular, when I talk about LGBTQI rights, I, I name those countries. Um, and I often think democracy, for me, in the European Union, is moving the the ship of change in a more progressive way, being as inclusive as we can. So that's bringing everybody in and not just people who grew up in the European Union, but people who are arriving into the European Union on a daily basis and want to see and want to grow up and make opportunity that we talk about in the European Union on a daily basis uh, a part of a part of their own um, their own uh, future aspirations. Um, and it's also democracy for me in the European Union is around conversation, communication. You know, there's a tell old sign of once you're explaining, you're losing. And I hate that analogy or, or that sentiment, because for me as a communicator, that is, I'm a politician. My job is to, to explain why certain things happen, try and encourage people to understand or look at why certain things in the European Union happens. So as, as you mentioned, you know, we're voting here in Strasbourg. Not everything is going to go to plan that I want it to. Um, but it's my job as a young politician, as a politician, as a young female politician, as someone who's LGBTQI, who's someone who grew up in rural Ireland, who has all these different tags and elements to, attached to myself to make sure, right, today didn't go well, not the way I wanted it to, but it's my job as a, as a centre 
center uh, progressive, if we're going to put taglines on it, who believes in European democracy, that I go back out and figure out a way to bring the left and right, to bring my colleague who in the EPP, which is where we sit, or a Fine Gael colleague or another Irish MEP closer together under the banner of democracy. Because once um, democracy and equality is very hard fought, but very quickly lost. And we see that in various other things too. So for me, it's it's a bandwidth of other other things. But I often think to to uh, to not be a too politician on it. I mean, I should have given you a shorter answer here, Barry. But like you know, politics and democracy is is a moving ship for me, um, or train, or or some sort of cargo, whatever whatever analogy folks want to listen to. But for me, it's a ship, and it's important that we have as many as many heartfelt open conversations on that ship moving towards a more equal society and that for me is eu democracy yeah, and i really like that analogy i actually noted it down the ship of change and i i can't help but think of david norris many years ago who who yeah. you know piloted that ship of change for lgbtqi rights he had to he kind of had to as you said he had to it was hard fought yeah. and, and that and even, happened I mean, at a European, even, yeah, absolutely. And when you think of um, bringing, bringing it back a little bit to the West of Ireland in terms of Mayo, our first female president, Mary McAleese, yes. or sorry, Mary Robinson. Dear me, I, I was talking about Mary McAleese <laughs> five minutes ago. Mary Robinson, who, who you know, that famous quote of, you know, women rocked the, you know, yes. like that's phenomenal because that's change, you know, but at the time, I can only imagine how difficult, and you mentioned David Nor. like I could only imagine how difficult it was at that time that it is, you, when you make change on a daily basis that shifts and moves that democratic ship, you don't get to reap the rewards immediately. It's, it's the generations ahead. And that for me is a beautiful sacrifice in what public life should be about, that you're constantly looking forward the generations ahead versus uh, consumed in the, the ego of politics that we see often uh, like around the analogy of It's like planting the oak tree so that future generations can enjoy it. And, and I know that only too well. I, I mentioned before we kind of went on, went live. My own grandmother was a TD in 1950s Ireland. And I mean, that, that was really a time. I mean, what a time to be a woman in Parliament. But just I just want to move on now to, to talk a little bit about EU democracy again. There's sometimes a perception And I've, I've heard this expressed online in particular, um, that the EU, oh, it's not democratic. And we saw a lot of this in the, the Brexit debates and all that type of thing. What's your view on that? And, and what's your own experience been now as an MEP? Yeah, I mean, it is essentially we feed into, um, you know, we have uh, we have national views and perspectives and obviously our own our own governments right across the European Union. Um, there's some who buy into what the European Union was built on and built for. Um, they believe in the term solidarity. And I'm really proud of, as, an, as an Irish woman that I, 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 I believe our government uh, or all politics in Ireland as a whole believes in the EU manifesto that, you know, opportunity, purpose, solidarity, We, we are built on, uh, unfortunately, the flames of war that ravaged um, the European Union uh, for, for years. Um, and unfortunately, though, uh, while you have some amazing things, there's other things that don't go to plan. So we have countries like Hungary and Poland, mm -hmm. um, elements of it in Czech Republic and, and Bulgaria um, um, that don't believe in the same change that you and I perhaps believe in, uh, that don't believe in you know, take, for instance, an LGBTQI woman, so a gay woman like myself, who can who can represent a country in one side of the Europe, um, but perhaps has a family or has a partner, um, calls that partner my wife and decides to move to the east side of, of the European Union. And my rights don't travel with me, nor does the rights of my children, hypothetically, you know, so when we talk about that overall democracy, then you're absolutely right. It's not equal, it's not balanced. We also were working on a file on gender-based violence right now and trying to make it a Euro crime. We have phenomenal issues, like phenomenal issues of not just what we've, many women have experienced coming out of the COVID pandemic in terms of uh, domestic violence, but we also have violence online that's ever growing. Um, and unfortunately, under the democracy of the EU, we have what we call, what I call 
political ping pong. Um, so certain certain MEPs, certain politicians, certain countries trying to get ahead and, and make and, and make it difficult for other countries to buy into. Um, we also have, you know, a country like Turkey, who's not a part of the European Union, but is a big player in how the European Union shapes in terms of migration. Um, stepping back from the Istanbul Convention. But we also have other countries like Czech Republic, Bulgaria, and other countries in the West of the European Union who don't believe that uh, women should be treated equal or, or, or young women, girls should be in, in full-time education. Um, so when you look at that, you think, as a young, I'm going to be truthful to you, I scratch my head sometimes going, but what are we doing here? What are, what are we doing as European citizens, as Irish citizens, um, as privileged people in today's world, when we think about it, to make the world a better place. But essentially, I always come back to, um, and I hope your listeners agree, if you are not around the table, if you are not willing to get off the armchair and be an activist in whatever whatever shape or form, um, then that polarised us and them, that growing ideology of what democracy looks like for one side of the of the union to the other is only go, going to grow further apart and it's down to countries like us like ireland who have this um beautiful you know this beautiful grow of bringing people together and having the conversations as difficult as they may be uh, to bring more and more of other and together uh, uh, and make the democracy as a whole move into that as we talked about earlier that you actually predicted some of the questions that, that I'm going oh, to sorry. ask which is great <laughs> and please is, cut me uh, off like you're doing because no, I can go no, on and no, it's a, a, a spin on this no it's, it's there's some points you made that I'm definitely going to go back to there and it's clear that across the EU there is there are democratic deficits what about the institutions of the eu itself how have you found that in terms of democracy yeah we don't i don't think we do we don't do well i i I don't think we do well enough in communicating what we do here uh to home so that's why you know given the given the opportunity to have a conversation with you today is fundamental to me because um i think it's so important that we have to find a way as politicians, as political parties, um, as newbies or, or as, as seasoned uh, leaders, that we consistently bring back the reason and look at the question, why? You know, why is why am I a politician? Why did I decide to run? Why is Ireland in the EU? Why is the EU formed? So that why question is so important. Um, and then that has to be bringing about talking to people that are living everyday lives that we are fighting for. Because I think right now the institutions, and I'm a part of that machine, um, think of these ideas and, and, and opportunities and think about making these changes legislatively, policy-wise, amendments, think about things like the Future of Europe conference. But then the biggest question on the conference and the Future of Europe right now is, well, when we're talking to people at grassroots level, how do we get it up to the policy and and and, and the beliefs and the brief documents over on this side in the institutions? Um, and, and it's not about government. That's what's wrong right now. We talk about government as if they are the player. They're not the player. The player is the person and the people we represent. And that and that balance is often uh, incorrect. That formula is often wrong, um, and that's essentially where we as uh, politicians need to get back to. You know, I, I think there's a beautiful thing, uh, you know, of the old and Irish times, and no doubt your grandmother was a part of this, yes. where you stood on the box outside the community oh, yeah. centre or church and you talked to people. You know. Or sit around the, the yeah. dinner table or the coffee table, and you're having you're having those conversations. I mean, I'm a teetotaler, so you know I try and avoid having too heavy political conversations in bars because it always goes south for me. But um, you know that one on one conversation is not happening as much as it should because we're online or we're in a vacuum. And to your point, I think the institutions, myself included. Uh, are are on the very fine line of of only living within the Brussels bubble or the vacuum. When in actual fact, we need to strip that back and and go back to the reason why and and talk to people face to face or virtually yeah, like we're yeah. doing here. I mean that's and that's one of the big things we're trying to do is trying to bridge that gap and and bring Brussels to to people and. Let them know yeah. that it, it isn't just this place or Strasbourg for that for that matter. It isn't this place over there 
you know, this this concerns you and, and you, you should have an input. So to, to just move on for that, obviously, the theme of this uh, series of interviews is about disinformation and the threat it poses to democracy. So do, do you think that EU democracy is under threat um, from disinformation campaigns at the moment? Absolutely. And sadly, I would have said that long before COVID even happened to all our lives. Um, we see a rise of anti, you know, anti vaccine, anti COVID, um, the conspiracy theories that align with it. Um, as a young politician, though, uh, I have to drop the young. I'm, I'm trying to make myself sound <laughs> a lot younger than I am. Apologies to anybody who's like, why she keeps saying that? Um, no, it um, is important. But, but I have to fight my corner, you know. Yes. Um, um, but I think you know there there is there is a growing um, rise of um, um, you know anti truth, anti media, anti free space, and it bubbles online on the on, on the social media sites. But if it's on there at the rate it's at, then it's very much apparent and growing and very much bubbling to the surface in the physical life. Um, you know, we blame bots, you know, these fake, fake things um, and, you know, certain individuals and organizations, even political groups are, are creating this, this, this fear, but that actually is happening in, in, in the physical sense too. Uh, we've seen it in January 6th in, in America, and that's not too far away from, from where we are right now too. Um, and for me, disinformation then is on a rise. Um, we see it in countries uh, around LGBTQI rights. We see it in countries like for women's rights. Um, we even see it in a sentiment and take it, for example, the Erasmus program. Take, for instance, and not as and not as fearful led as other things that I mentioned. But, you know, there there's a conception and an idea that Erasmus is only for the highbrow academics is only for those that go to the universities when in actual fact that's a disinformation that that's a lie it's for it's for all um uh under a certain age but it is for all but we haven't sold that and we haven't broken the barrier of making sure the right information is at the fingertips at the right time um and the other does it extremely well because uh, i think i read a statistic um a couple of weeks ago that uh, uh, fake news travels like 72 percent faster than real news wow. online and when you but, think but that that's incredible like, and with that in mind though i mean obviously i mean i spoke um in our first interview to ricardo de silva he, he spoke about all the, this fake news and disinformation on social media and what advice would you give to voters to someone like me and i'm seeking information before for example the next european election yep you know, should I do because I'm being bombarded by this false information? Yeah, well, first and foremost, uh, anybody who's looking to uh, for information on the European elections in 2024, they're held in May of, of 2024. There's three years to go. Plenty of time for women in diversity uh, to run, to put their hand up. I'm not even making a call for my own party of Finnegal. I'm making a call just to change the landscape of, of, of which, uh, because I believe community needs to be reflected in our politics and our politics need to be reflected in our community. And it breaks down what we talked about earlier uh, in terms of the disinformation, the disconnect. Anyways, aside from that, making my, my pledge to get more people involved in politics. Um, for me, I try and uh, if personally, I try and look for three new sources. Um, so be it a broadsheet, an online reliable source, and uh, 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 an outspoken, dare I say, influencer online who I know is also reading similar articles to myself. But I also think there's truth to, uh, and I've seen a, a number uh, of media folk suggested over COVID, like you need to be following the other voice in order to fully understand where they're at. And also to break down of you uh, of online now in particular, your online channels of just consuming the vacuum of voices that you're used to hearing and seeing. You know, no nobody should ever, I believe, you know, I, I, for me personally, I try not to, um, you know, only hear from people who look like me, sound like me, talk like me, because ultimately then I'm in a vacuum of my own thoughts and ideas and I'm actually not reflective of what's out there, nor am I on the cusp of what, is happening in other people's lives. And that's wrong for me as uh, a European, as an Irish woman, and, and as a political um, a, a Ricardo da Silva uh, actually spoke about exactly that. He called it the future yeah. bubble. 
uh, yeah. where people and stay in their own bubble and only listen to kind of what they they will kind of want to hear. Yeah. And to your point, Barry, earlier in terms of like the vacuum of uh, the vacuum that is the institutions, unfortunately, that, that's what's happened over the last number of years. Um, and we assume people will buy into what we're saying because we're politically elected or we've read some things or we have a, a, a third level degree when in actual fact um, we're, that disconnect is happening at, at a rapid pace. So for me, I try and do that. Um, I I try and while it's very difficult uh, to hear the other voice, so um, take US politics in particular, I, I, I have family members who didn't vote the way I would have voted, um, but it's really important that I listen and try and break down the reasons why and try and hear that why question so that I can inform myself better. So when I am talking to the next person that doesn't agree with me, that I'm also being under, understood, but more more so being understanding to what they might be might be saying, because otherwise, otherwise we end up in those, again, vacuums and the us and them become so much louder and bigger online and in the physical space. People so find that themselves. Would be some of those, yeah. Yeah. So when people find us in difficult situations economically, they tend to go to more extreme answers. I mean, we've yeah. seen that throughout yeah. history and we're seeing it again now. Absolutely. And then in, in, in run up to the European elections, um, it's only pity Blanche is not in, in, in my constituency, but you have some amazing representatives. Um, and I think it's really important that we have, a, a, I believe it's still a pilot project in a lot of our secondary schools throughout the country of uh, politics and society. I, yeah. So why not get, why not gift um, those young schoolgoers an opportunity to use the spaces like you have um, to, to hold hustings to have these honest conversations in front of people and it, and 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 have that two-way conversation so that people are leaving informed of what they just physically heard right in front of them versus only going to online news sources so like I mean, it's easier said than done now because we've just experienced and hopefully coming out of this pandemic where people are keeping space um, to, to, to keep safe. But as, as those barriers begin to break down more and more, I think we need to get out uh, and begin to start these conversations. And ultimately, if you have um, um, an interest in a certain policy or a social change, whatever it may be, perhaps you're big into foreign policy and you're following what's happening right now in Afghanistan, then why can't you organize something through uh, your local library that you guys have here and, and bring in other voices so that you're not only consuming what you feel you should be consuming and that you're always challenged with the other. I think, I think when we sit comfortably in, I know all, I see all, then we're actually doing a disservice to what what is out there uh, and ultimately that's why we have a disconnect yeah i think that's that that makes a lot of sense yeah it's, it's so important to, to to look at the the other side and i i can tell you that we we have plans when things hopefully return to normal to get young people in and maybe do a mock okay. council of europe or a mock parliament oh, it's something cool. yeah it's something that's been in in my mind for quite some time and hopefully we'll, we'll make that a reality and um, the next time i want to ask is it something probably a little bit more personal and um, you yourself have been the subject of disinformation online. Would you mind telling me a little bit about that and, and the effect it had? Yeah, absolutely. So unfortunately, when you put your hand up and get involved, and for me, I've been in the public life uh, since 2014 as the International Rose of Chile, and perhaps people know me for my sexual orientation more than they know the fact that I'm also a diehard Mayo fan, so still, still, still upset my, over my what we experienced. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, he says it with such a big smile on his face. Thanks. <laughs> no, no, genuinely <laughs> not. Genuinely. Um, but for for you know for me, so I, I, in 2014, when when the Rose actually um, gifted me my podium uh, to to shout from the rooftops about certain issues like mental health or um, women's rights or uh, or LGBTQI rights. Um, you know, there was a stem of, of online in particular uh, of hate speech. Um, and there was a clear crossover when I entered in or put my hand up to run for public office. There was a very clear crossover within like an hour of that happening. The, the, the venom that we've seen online in terms of just utter hate speech uh, became rampant. So gone are the days in 2014 where you'd have to go down a couple of different forums or channels or kind of fall into the social bubble before you found real, real hate uh, towards me uh, around my orientation or what I what I might have just spoken about. Whereas uh, when I put my hand up and got involved in politics, it became, you didn't have to go down so far, unfortunately. Um, when I ran for election in 2019, 
uh, a website was developed. Um, it's still live. Um, I actually just recently got renewed, which is which is a pity because um, it is disinformation. Um, it is saying things like I brainwash children with my uh, gay ideology. I'm uh, a disservice to uh, the communities. I'm changing the culture of our country. Um, I'm um, I'm a harmful human being uh, that only wants to create uh, more and more LGBTQI communities. Say, th this website was set up specifically to attack you, is that yeah, right? And to yeah. notice information very, you know, about you. Know, you. Very, yeah, very professional website. And it came live, actually. Um, it was obviously live for, for the period of the campaign. It just never came on uh, my team and I's, uh, uh, you know, across our, across our screens. And then, unfortunately, it became very, very live for us in real uh, in the coming in, in, in the days leading into the final the final uh, the final uh, voting day. Um, and I got to give it credit. My party, Fine Gael, you know, our press office took control because we're out and about meeting as many people trying to spread the word of of getting involved in, and why I'm running. Um, and 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 they took uh, just control of making sure I was protected, my family was protected, mm -hmm. and trying to pull this down. Um, the issue was not necessary. The website, even though it's very sophisticated, um, it has a lot of, uh, as you shared, disinformation. Um, but they were buying Google ads and ads on Facebook. Um, and because of that, if you typed Maria Walsh, it was the first thing that you seen. Wow. And then it was uh, categorically choosing people in terms of um, demographics and age demographics yeah. across the constituency. So we were fighting against a different machine, uh, not just a website, but also the analytics that go with online uh, online search, too. So when 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 uh, Facebook said that was free speech and it was entitled to be up there, unfortunately, Google also said the same, but they uh, then said they would uh, reduce in the number of ads this person was buying, wouldn't remove it because it is free speech, which to me it, it is is a yeah. is an alarming concern that I can type I could type about you, Barry, something that yeah. is completely um, yeah. wrong, uh, I, illegal, uh, and yet under the banner of online, it, it can remain. And, it's, and something I discussed in more detail with, um, it's an upcoming interview after this goes out with Dr. Eileen Cullody, and we spoke about that balance between free speech, but also taking down disinformation. So, I mean, we can see there that, I mean, this disinformation has a real effect. And I can only imagine, personally, that must have been quite difficult as well. I mean, it's not very nice to have this kind of thing up about you online yeah. that many people can see. And, and, you know, people sadly don't seem to care about that, the, the personal effect. Yeah. You know, I think, and to that point, absolutely. You know, I think, you know, when I entered public life, like I said, in 2014, you know, I did that. You know, I, I put my hand yeah. up and got involved in, 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 a, in, a, in a public way, not my family, um, not my future partner. Um, so seeing what 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 my family had seen um, and, and what my future partner would see, um, God willing, um, is is really when you think about it from that perspective is really, really harmful and really um, uh, just really sad. But then when you flip the switch, flip the script and you look at it from, say, a young LGBTQI individual, um, particularly a trans community or an older gay man or woman or trans community member, then you're thinking, wow, if if she's getting that much abuse, what would I ever get? And then you step back further, further into the closet of of despair. And that, to me, is where and what is wrong with the likes of that website uh, and and the online world that spews and spins this this fake news so, and hate speech. So this disinformation can can not just harm the people it's aimed at, but other people as well. Yeah. So yeah. you know, I want I want to just move on. You you mentioned already. I mean, you were born in the United States and and you've lived there uh, for, for some time. And I suppose in recent years we've seen in America. I mean, disinformation really on the rise. I mean, we've all saw it in the last election campaign. Um, and there seems to be a real polarisation that's happened over there. Uh, like, a, and, mm. and we've kind of lost the middle ground uh, completely. Mm -hmm. And is this something we need to be wary of in the European Union? Or is, indeed, is it already happening in places? 
I mean, to, to that point, it's already happening. Um, and it's our job that uh, it doesn't. And by our job, I mean, not just mine. I mean, this conversation, you, anybody watching this, it's our job to ensure that we're not losing the wood from the trees here um, and, and, and the side of that. Um, and that we're making sure that we are being rational, that media has a space to be free and to be critical and that's crucial to keeping democracy alive we also have access to what is transparent and accountable and accurate um, of those in our public life as well as you know the the buildings the institutions uh that that we we sit in uh, and we represent in i think that's extremely important um, and also it's really important that we have, as I said earlier, our community in our politics and our politics in our community, because then you begin to hear all voices and you begin to knock down this other and us and, and polarized narrative. I mean, what's happening in the United States didn't just happen in 2016 when former President Trump took office. Um, I'm really showing my politics here, but I'm wearing blue so you can kind of get the, get the feel of where I'm going. Um, um, it didn't just happen then. It's been happening for years before that. Um, it, it was just a perfect storm with him and he, he sped and spun uh, hateful lies and deceit and we ended up with a very physical display of what disinformation and disconnect happens on January 6th. That is also happening in, in our country. I mean, not to hone in on just LGBTQI rights, but we've seen it with homophobic slurs over pride uh, in Dublin. We've seen it in uh, in Waterford with the uh, with the pride flag being removed. Um, you know, I... I was a part of a school launch that celebrated European students visiting a very rural school in County Galway. And they hung up the, they, they, we pulled up the European flag as well as the rainbow flag. And the rainbow flag was removed um, by, uh, uh, by somebody. Uh, and a lot of hate speech was gifted, unfortunately, towards that school. So, and that's just in one small sector of what the European Union is and is about and what society is about. Um, so we do, it is, uh, it's very much alive online. Um, and, and I think, I think sometimes as Irish people, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong, but as Irish people, we sit perhaps a little bit too comfortably in like, well, that's out there. Yes. Like we're rational people here in Ireland. We might have our argument, but we'll get on, but that's not the case anymore. That's not the case. We're, we're, we're comfortable sitting and reading 144 characters of a tweet or a headline without actually reading the, the, the synopsis, the beef of, of what is being discussed. And I can tell you there's a lot of stuff that comes out of the EU institutions at home that I get phone calls for. Why did you vote this way? Why did you vote that way? And it's like, but I actually didn't. It's just whatever way was spun. And we have to do a lot, a lot more work to read through, to educate ourselves, to have conversations and actually not be told what to think and say, but actually decide for ourselves what we want to think and what we want to say. Yeah, we have to be wary because we, we kind of think, oh, well, America's over there. It's happening there. We're fine. You know, and, and we, I, my fear is that maybe we get complacent. My own wife is, yeah. is French and we can see the rise of extremist groups in France. There's a presidential election coming there. And, and you know, this extremist vote has been growing and, and it's something to, to watch. And I think yeah. we have to be we have to be wary. Um, we're not immune to this in, in the European Union. And, I, and to that point, as I said, like democracy and equality is a hard fought, but very quickly lost. Absolutely. And with, with that in mind, I mean, you, you already mentioned Poland and Hungary and, and, you know, we're seeing threats to democracy in those countries at the moment. And, and you, it's, it's also just under the surface in other countries. We've seen it in Italy. I've mentioned France. There's far right groups in Germany, Holland, where my own sister lives. It's yeah, I mean, this is everywhere. It's just come more to the surface in those countries. Uh, what is the EU doing to counter these threats to democracies in, in countries like Poland and Hungary? And what would you like to see done? Yeah, what we're, we're, we're discussing. So there's a couple of different committees that this gets discussed on, particularly democracy. One in one in particular is our civil liberties, justice and home affairs. So LIBE for short. So L-I-B-E, if anybody wants to check out the European okay. Parliament website, you can find out exactly what we're discussing at committee level and the debates upcoming. Um, but LIBE committee talks everything from cyber violence to cyber security, to migration, to what we call slap suits. So um, a lot of the, the, the protection around journalists for free media, 
um, democracy as a whole. We'll discuss Afghanistan later on today. Um, the State of the Union speech with the President Ursula von der Leyen will happen tomorrow. So a lot will come from that too, in terms of the protection of democracy. Um, you know, for just LGBTQI stuff too, we see through the Court of Justice, the Commission has taken Poland and Hungary to court and we're waiting for proceedings to really begin to ignite there um, because there's narratives that, that are coming from Viktor Orban and the Hungarian government right now um, that will say anybody uh, under the 18, under 18 who even consumes uh, LGBTQI narrative. So that's like, a tweet, uh, a book, uh, a program um, is essentially bre breaking the law um, and brain being brainwashed. Um, within that, the consumption of media outlets is becoming less and less. So we're very fortunate we have the likes of this and we're having an independent conversation. Um, that doesn't exist in the likes of Poland and Hungary. When you look at Poland in particular, um, and a very, very close narrative to us here in Ireland, because we, we twin a lot of our towns with them, um, there's communities uh, in a very cosmopolitan area um, that put up um, LGBT uh, signs with a big X in it saying LGBT free zone. So can you imagine Blanchettown uh, businesses and private residents putting them up in windows to force out LGBTQI? Uh, and it's not just individuals like myself, it's allies and activists who work within that space who might not even be gay themselves, but who believe in equality. Um, so you've that long. So, uh, Court proceedings are happening there. Essentially, from my side, I go back and forth on this a little bit. Um, do you strip back funding from countries like that? Um, if Ireland was doing that, do we strip back the funding that's happening there? Um, in many ways, it, you feel it most in the pocket, but it's mostly the communities, those minority groups that feel it the worst because they're not getting any funding then. Um, so for us, it's making sure we're following the uh, pr correct procedures. If funding restrictions have to happen, then they have to happen. But then it's up to us, me and you, and particularly here in the institutions of Strasbourg and Brussels, to ensure that the Commission and Council are now then putting more funding into the development of minority voices to that other voice so that they also have a free space and a protective space. Um, you know, I think migration is going to be one of the biggest things that we talk about for generations to come. And we have to find a way a legal way and a safe way for people to move into um, our communities. Um, and I'm not just talking about people coming in from countries. I'm also talking about our own DNA and how we talk about the other two. And we have to do an awful lot of education of community groups, be it through libraries like this, that we're having these conversations of why. I mean, we're a land of of migrants ourselves. when you think about it. We built Absolutely. pretty much every town, village and, and city right across the world. Um, so we're we're a beacon of light for many, uh, and therefore we should we we should continue to be a beacon of light for people coming in and out of. Absolutely, our and I, I only look at my my own street. My my next door neighbours are Syrian refugees, best neighbours I could ever hope for. I have to say they're absolutely wonderful. But yeah, I mean I, I, I'm glad you used the word education because again this has come up in some of the other interviews. That seems to be the silver bullet to a lot of these things, and I think the more. Mm educated people are, the less they fall for disinformation, less likely they are to fall into extremist views. You mentioned the politics and society programme. We've definitely connected with local schools uh, about that and, and tried to facilitate different events to, to encourage learning there. Um, so just to... to can, I, can, I really, yeah. can I really cut across you there? And I know, I'm, 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 I know I'm, not, I'm not even giving you a break to, to, to no, please do. on to the questions, but you know, I think there's a narrative sometimes that once we finish, be it secondary school or primary school or college, that our learning is done. But there's there's an element of lifelong learning that we talk about all the time in the in the parliament here because the commission is really excited by it. And that has to be a part of our everyday life that just because or even in the workplace, just we're going to have several careers in our life. Uh, we're going to have several opportunities to learn every day is a school day, regardless of whether it's in a business that you work for 20 years or you build from the ground, whether it be uh, like yourself working in in, in in the sector that you do that 
has all this information coming at you, um, it's so important that we begin to understand that every day we have an opportunity to challenge our status quo and our unconscious bias. And we have to start stripping that back and believe in the element that lifelong learning exists and has to exist in the protection of democracy and make our society a more equal place. And that's just one of the lines I wanted to add there. I'm so glad you said that because I'm a great believer in lifelong learning and it's my chance to plug the libraries here at Blanchetown, but also all over the country. You have a great place where you can go to continue your learning on any subject. And I agree, there's a great French writer, Marcel Pagnol, uh, and he, one of his character fi- famous, he said, il ne faut jamais perdre une occasion de s'instruire. You never miss an opportunity to learn. And it's something I, I, I you're, really you're, believe you're, in. You're, you're a partner. I think you said your wife, though. Your wife is French, very indeed. proud of your pronunciation. Uh, there we are. Well, I studied <laughs> French and lived there. So uh, I, and that Strasbourg's a place I'd love to visit. Um, so I, actually, at the end, I must ask you about the flights there. But anyway, um, so more and more people these days seem to be seeking their information, whether it be on politics, vaccines, COVID, anything else, seem to be seeking it in less traditional places. Mm-hmm. Uh, like news sources or so on. And they often rely on social media, whether it be memes or whatever else, or blogs written by quite obviously unqualified people. Why do you think people are moving to these sources rather than the more traditional ones? Uh, Unfortunately, convenience, speed. Um, uh, We're time poor, uh, but we're information heavy. Uh, So how do you sift through that? Um, I think, and please, I hope one of the the listeners quote, uh, squashes this because I, I I read over the summer that YouTube is now our our second um, uh, search engine essentially. So in many times it would have been Google or Chrome, whatever you might be use Safari, um, but Google or YouTube is our second one because people want to consume information in less than a minute. Um, but how do you get all stories and all sides of a story and all sides of a narrative or a decision in under a minute? Like that's impossible um but yet we're 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 we as consumers are demanding that so in many ways do you blame the person the politician who's trying to get 144 characters of a tweet or a media out there trying to attract and chase and be at the top of their game when consumers want it in their hand uh, at a at a smaller pace at a faster speed um and i think that is uh consumerism i think time uh i think being time poor i think um, we we want everything yesterday. Um, yes. I think honor the days where we're willing to have a face to face conversation. And and a lot of people, I think, assume you know it's just online where, where I might be bashing here, but I'm not. You know, I think particularly coming out of COVID, I even see it myself. And my job is to communicate. Like I see more and more issues of not just younger people where we comfortably blame and point fingers at, but older people who have difficulties keeping eye contact with people or sitting longer and having conversations that are willing to ask someone in the street for directions because we're all consumed by what's in front of us through it be a smartphone or exactly. Um, And, and I think, you know, I think, that is a sad day for all things, not just democracy when we have that. So we need to be really mindful that we are, um, you can be modern and traditional in your communication, you know, Um, and, and um, yeah. And I think we just need to be really, really cognizant and mindful of where, where we are taking this information. And I also think it's not just YouTube's Facebooks. I think WhatsApp plays a big part of, of the sharing of disinformation. So you need to be mindful too of, the, the the type of stuff that is coming to you. And if it seems extremely intense, um, there's a solid chance that you might need to step back and see other, other news streams coming from it. Um, I mean, for us here in particular in the parliament, uh, in a lot of the groups, when we speak to activists right across the European Union or outside, like we make a conscious effort not just to talk to politicians or media outlets, but actually activists on the ground too, because then we get the triangle of truth, or at least as close to the truth as we need to. Um, um, and it's important then for us to ask questions that are constantly challenging the unconscious bias of our own or or the person that we're we're hearing from, so that again, yeah. the truth rises to the rises to the top versus the disinformation. 
Yeah, and, and Ricardo de Silva actually specifically mentioned um, WhatsApp yesterday because it's more of a closed bubble and the information tends to come from people we would trust, family members, friends, and it, it can be more difficult to say, ooh, maybe I should be wary of that. But yeah, it's, and I think you're right. We have to take personal responsibility as well yeah. for you know, I, I've become, maybe it's my old age now, uh, um, I've become super, I've become super aware and mindful of the fact that even if we are watching something on Netflix or or Disney Plus or Prime, wherever, wherever it is you're getting, getting some of your documentaries or your shows, that we don't even have to watch the credits anymore or the opening titles. You can go skip, skip the recap. Like we're now so busy that we can't even sit for 60 seconds or 90 seconds. Like, think about that for a second like that. And that is just for a show that we might just be watching on a, on a, on a rainy Tuesday evening at home versus, you know, what we're doing also in, our, in, in the real information. We're also trying to skip ahead and get just to the punchline so we have quick information. Um, and that that's simply not the case, you know. Well, I'll point people to the Fingal Library's YouTube channel and we have lots of videos there all about mindfulness and that can be a way maybe to teach us to slow down a little bit, right. take our time with information and, and, you know, make an effort to really, really find out about the issues. So the last thing I want to ask you about and then kind of finish on a, on a positive note, I think one of the best ways of strengthening democracy, whether that be at a local, national or an EU level, is to get more people engaged and involved and more different types of people, whether that be LGBT, whether that be different ethnicities and um, different ages, different socioeconomic backgrounds and so on, to get people involved. The young people in particular, as, as you and we have said this, you are a young MEP and young people are a notoriously difficult group to reach and to get involved in politics, let alone vote. Um, what do you think we need to do to encourage more young people to get engaged in the democratic process? Would that be just voting and um, getting involved in campaigns or actually running as candidates? Yeah, for, I mean, uh, if I had the answer to this question, I'd be delighted because our, 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 our party would be attracting a lot more younger people, which I think all political parties need, need to do. Um, for me, I really think it comes back to something that we, we chatted about, the education piece. I think the politics and society pilot project that they ran um, and is now amping up to be in a full time full time cycle, I think, is so important. But I actually think it's happening quite, quite late. So we used to rely on, you know, CSPE. And I think that's a phenomenal module, phenomenal program. But we didn't necessarily talk about or have, I mean, for me in particular, no, no disrespect to my teachers, um, you know, there wasn't anybody really involved or wanting for us to develop our own voices and thoughts through the prism of CSPE. And I think that's where it's really missing. I think the reason why referendums like the marriage equality or the repeal the eighth were so topical and we had such an influx of young voters is because it's sexy and trendy and it's quick and it's society and an issue making waves of change. But you mentioned like David Norris and, you know, I mentioned even Mary, Mary Robinson or Mary McAleese, you know, the change happens in time. And unfortunately, I think as a younger person, we want to see the change yesterday um, where it actually takes time moving that ship uh, to bring more and more people involved. And I think if we had more people involved at a younger age to understand the dynamics, A, we have a different speed and an energy because we have different people involved, as you mentioned, minority groups, young women, um, LGBTQI, the other, that often feels left out of, uh, of the conversation. So we have them involved. So the energy is different. We have a lot more nuanced conversations and trying to bring people together versus splitting them apart, which is what we live in now, unfortunately. Um, and for me, I think we cannot sit comfortably in the armchair talking about with our friends and our mates and our partners to say, you know, I'm sick and tired of like, uh, you know, the, 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 nar we're not making any changes on our climate and I'm tired of not seeing more bike lanes and I'm tired of not seeing more, uh, publicly funded libraries. Um, and then, you know, the next night we're sitting at the same chair, having the same conversation. 
Um, and this is where we have to take accountability and put our hand up and get involved as scary as it is. But if we are not involved, nothing changes. So again, back to the story that we were chatting about, like if you, if you are around a table of change and you do not see the other voice, then it's up to you to go find them. But it's also up to you as that other voice to get involved. Um, and for me, I think conversation, communication, um, um, and face to face, I think we need to start doing more hustings in universities, um, trying to give and work with with younger people so that they have the skills to create these spaces of good conversation and real conversation uh, and to begin to tear down the walls that everything lives only online. Um, and I think something like what you guys have going on in the library and right across uh, trying to create this narrative but I'm sure you scratch your head too and like how do we get people in here and involved and it's it's a two-way street we have to take accountability as consumers but we also have to ensure that um, we're supporting folks like yourself um, uh, in making these conversations real um, and, and I wish I had a better formula and I could go on about this question for a long a lot longer one. yeah um, and it is a hard one because you know we take out as a politician I take ads out in 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 the newspaper all the time and then I'm being told people are not seeing them so then you go online but then other people are not seeing them and then there's different ages represented on different social media outlets and I'm, I'm great with that but give me a person um you know in front of me and let's have a real real honest conversation because then it's richer and then it's fuller and then it's more colorful and more honest and that's what we're trying to do with at europe direct and we've the, the the conference in the future of europe we've a few of those coming up and, and we deal a lot with schools i have to say and the one thing i will say that is heartening we've run a lot of events over the years and i've seen some extraordinary young people who've been really engaged and a lot of young women in particular and a lot of what you might term the new irish often people who are born here but parents who might have come from another country and, and it's great to see them getting involved and being so enthusiastic. So I, I'm quite hopeful um, that, you know, some of the people I've seen that in the next few years, in the next two distant years, I'm going to see them up on posters. I'm going to see them getting elected. And, you know, and, and that's, you know, we, we, we can only hope. Yeah. So listen, I, on that note, I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, Maria Walsh, MEP. That was a really fascinating conversation. Um, it was it was great to hear your point of view on on these issues on European democracy on disinformation. Um, there's a lot of work to do, obviously, but but thank you for your input. Thank you very much for the time, uh, and I look forward to visiting you all in in Blanchery really soon, if not at a library uh, closer to Midlands Northwest. So delighted, and thank you uh, for facilitating such an honest and open conversation.